first day of the class, I walk in, I write my name on the chalkboard, and uh, except he wouldn't go as Bill Martell. He wrote his name out on the chalkboard as Pat Fear. I'm Mr. Fear. So his students called him Mr. Fear. So <laughs> on that note, I'm going to read Bill's piece. We got power, huh? <laughs> Awkward grammar, poor spelling, scribbled and badly typed haphazard layouts, inane redundant, the band rocked and got the crowd dancing live reviews, Circle One, SVDB, Red Cross before the extra uh, DD and K, Bart's Apollo, Cuckoo's Nest, Dancing Waters, The Vex, Godzilla's Kathy de Grand. The names bring to mind weird two color, but not color printing. Heavy paper, glossy covers, years before the firebrand flip side even tried such feats. Something to do with John Macias' father owning a print shop. No Effects' first gig was opening up for Sin 34, whose drummer just so happened to be the editor of We Got Power. I remember the HB's punk violence and printed reviews of police instigated riots that happened nowhere outside of California, in particular in home base SoCal on a scale that you can't even imagine. Then came a really tall art damaged guitar player from New York blown away that a West Coast mag reviewed his killer fanzine in a fanzine. <laughs> Kids in Aberdeen and Los Alamitos getting schooled on the Huntington Beach Valley and Nardcore scenes. An amazing compilation album, We Got Power, Party or Go Home. And not to mention an interview with some bald guy I first met when he was a roadie for the Teen Idols gig at the Hong Kong Cafe years earlier. You know, the guy who took Des Cadena's place and became the last in the long line of charismatic singers from one of LA's earliest and best South Bay bands. He doesn't name them, but we know who they are. We Got Power heard and published the resonating peals of those days. The photos and fanzine collected here are impressionistic sketches, each one illustrating and simultaneously creating its own sketchy times, replete with the vague first name plus the band in photo captions or references, plus some quirky details jotted down and printed out in a format that wasn't as flashy as the internet, but had a lot more soul. It all meant more because everything was harder then, from the making of the music to documenting and disseminating it. Those We Got Power guys were not from the original scene any more than Monica West was a Chicago blues singer obscure star rock reference for those here in the know. Um, <clears throat> I was, and the other 20 or 100 or so of us LA punks who lived punk from 1976 onward, dragging glitter and metal into the gutter, pretty much resented the next few generations as a whole. During the premiere of the decline of the Western civilization, with police hassles outside bordering on a riot, for a movie for God's sake, one of the invite-only old schoolers, four years old, really only at the time, yelled, kill the second generation. The theater erupted in rousing applause. Punk had already started to suck. Many gave up on it, moved on, or died as it died out. We were now the old regime, and far too quickly the hippie spoofing punk catchphrase, never trust anyone over 30, had gone from an inside joke to reality. But these poor typists and Santa Monica middle class miscreants somehow heralded a new hardcore. It was brooming, an energetic but often interchangeable music that was quickly sucking all the style, tunefulness, and creativity from the early music of the LA punk scene. It needed its own voice, its own subgenre instruction, instruction manual. 
The likes of X and the Germs were already almost oldies by the time the first issue, We Got Power, was published in 1981, usurped by an arrival, uh, an arrival of a larger audience for prime bands like the Adolescents, Circle Jerks, and the Chiefs, whose deliberately misspelled moniker was not only correctly written by a few publications at the time, including this minimalist magazine, this was the document of the real decline, as the innovative spirit of the early days in scenes terms were shoved aside, literally and often physically, by jock mentality, media pawns, and a few bright sparks of creative power. Via Harcourt's fast as possible core changes, doused in fake or pointless anger. Yes, the same complaint as old timers have always had about latecomers or I should save their rhetoric. I know, because this West Side gang, in their own off-kilter approach, approach, way more hardcore than fellow Dogtowners' suicidal tendencies, who are actually really nice guys. These self-publishers really had power, and often mightier, uh, an often mightier sword, the power of print. <clears throat> Where these youngsters got the nerve to revive that original punk spirit, independent of any direct experience, and how they found each other's kindred spirits are puzzles I'd never really quite figured out. For that intangible reason, they were accepted. In return, they amazed us with some now heralded, uh, now heralded Ed Culver photography shots, incredible live and candid time capsules by Jordan and Allison Braun, AKA Mouse, Left of center writers like Jennifer Schwartz and Kim Pilkington, guest editorials by innovators such as Spot, who's here tonight, and Keith Morris. They interviewed Nervous Gender and reviewed Vox Pop over and over again, luring Circle Jerks and TSOL fans into that psychotic mindset that your average fifth waiver would never otherwise have encountered in any form. No failed hippie fa politics of maximum rock and roll here. <laughs> no early scene cred as Flipside or Michelle Bear as The Panic in LA, but a mind altering power of its own making. The original zines barely made it out of California, but now they're posted for the world to see in an instant on the internet. No need for a desperate record store search or mail order treasure hunt crawling via the nearly extinct U.S. Postal Service across state and country borders. Yes, this book is an easier conduit to the bridges between punk rock and hardcore, but yet it is still hardcore through its own insidious madness and more tangible than something on an LCD screen. Smell the ink, touch the paper, lick it. Smell the sweat and clove cigarettes, and maybe something will move you to think in grammar poor English and find your own power. P.S. Revisiting this time period for me has reminded me how many unique and talented people I knew or admired or who were a part of the staff of this magazine or are depicted in pictures in this book, named in reviews or interviews or even just involved concurrently in the local punk scene during that era who are no longer with us. Rob Graves Ritter, Roz Williams, Roger Rogerson, Dennis Donnell, Bobby Bratt, Todd Barnes, three out of five members of RKL, Brent Lillies, Gerardo Velasquez, Paula Pierce, El Ducci, John Macias, Dave Dracon, Steve-O, Rick L. Rick, Will Shatter, D. Boone, Frank Nevetta, Mike Weber, Randy Biscuit Turner, Drew Blood, Renee Gade, Joey Eight, and of course, we got power staffer Kim Pilkington. Sadly, this is no way a complete list. Bill Bartell. <laughs> uh, Bill passed away about a year or two after that writing. And that concludes. Uh, hey, yeah, our thank you, Dave. <laughs> Wow. Oh, I got one more quick story to tell. Yes. <laughs> you, 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 um 
the whole Bill Kiss thing. Uh, one night, uh, I was late night shopping in my uh, West Hollywood neighborhood supermarket, and uh, who should I see shopping? It's about one in the morning, but none other than Paul Stanley himself. <laughs> Paul Stanley uh, was walking around the store with this shopping cart that was filled with nothing more than packaged lunch meats and a Lady in the Tramp VHS videotape. I kid you not. I actually heard him say to someone, Yeah, I just came into town for a concert. You know, um, uh, at any rate, of course, I rushed home and called Bill right away and said, you will not believe who, you know, I just encountered in the, uh, the uh, WeHo uh, Gelson's. And I told him the story. And of course, Bill was doing a story for some publication or another, and he was actually interviewing him the following day. So Bill actually goes right up to Paul and says, so... How was the Lady in the Tramp VHS? <laughs> and Paul's, uh, Paul Stanley's return to Bill was, Do you always hang out in supermarkets? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, thank you very much. And happy birthday, Dave. Happy birthday. I would torture him with seeing happy birthday, but that's a uh, little... Well, that's my gift to you, one of my gifts to you. Okay, hey, so that, that's it for this reading. Hey, thank you, everybody. Thank you, as Walt, Mike Walt would say, thanks to the gig goers. <laughs> Start your own book. Um, actually, but thanks for hanging out. Um, there are the books. I can sell you books here also. Um, I have some copies of Love Doll Superstar for 15 bucks. Bill plays... Bill wears his cop uniform in this film, and there's a bunch of other awesome stuff. Robert Hackard has a, has a great uh, piece in there. And then also, uh, I have some original uh, We Got Power fanzine number fours for $20 as well. So if you want to hear, let me know. Also, there's a picture of Bill hanging up on the wall, a framed photo out by the uh, cash register. So do the, you know, Shepherd Ferry Banksy exit through the gift shop thing. Pay your respects yeah. to Bill and buy a I copy of We Got Power. Thank you very much. Oh, also, thank you, Pat Hoed, for uh, DJing. He'll play us out. There's a lot.